you have your Bible, 1 Thessalonians, if you don't have your Bible, there's a Bible in the seat back in front of you, under you. I will be on page 986 on that Bible, 1 Thessalonians 1 through 10. If you've been here, we've started a new sermon series in 1 Thessalonians, and we've been in the first chapter now for three weeks. And so we're, we're going we're gonna to get through the first chapter, and then we're going to start chapter two next week. Um, if you like to take notes or um, this, uh, you know, sermon title is always helpful to maybe keep you engaged. Uh, the idea that we're going to get at in First Thessalonians 1 through 10 is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It justifies you and sanctifies you. So last week we looked at the gospel of Jesus Christ, how it came to the Thessalonians, uh, not only in war, but also in power, which brought justification. Uh, justification is how someone is made right or have a restored relationship with God as being holy and a sinner. It comes through Jesus. So the gospel brings justification and it brings sanctification. So how you grow as a Christian is the same way as you became a Christian. You grow by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So sanctification is simply how are we maturing to become more like Jesus. If you don't know that, that's the end goal of Christianity, that Christ is formed in you. So the same way that you are justified, saved, if you will, is the same way that you become like Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So uh, one theologian said uh, this way about this truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ, or grace justifies and sanctifies, is that God sees us as we are, that's you know justification, he loves us as we are, justification, and accept us, uh, accepts us as we are, that's justification. But by his grace, that's the, 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 moans, uh, the mode or the means, he does not leave us as we are. So there's a progression. He's changing us by the grace that justifies us. He's transforming us with that same grace. And as I mentioned last week, that's what the, the, the text and sermon was really all about. We looked at verse 5. Because our gospel, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done. It's come to you not only in word, but also in power. They're, they're, the Thessalonican church experienced this truth, received this truth, surrendered to this truth. And we got to look at justification first. The gospel of Jesus Christ justifies. Uh, I like the quote because it says that God sees you as you are. Now that's, that, that's part of justification, understanding the gospel for the first time, that God sees you, all of you, how no one else sees you. Now that's an amazing truth, like because the person who knows me best in this world is my wife, Marcy. But even then, she doesn't fully see me. Uh, things that I don't always fully reveal, or maybe I don't even know about myself, right? God sees all of me. That's incredible. You are not known by anyone on this earth fully except by God. And God sees you, and it says he loves you as you are. He sees all of you, and you're a mess, and so am I. I have had a... <laughs> a history of a mess in my life, currently still somewhat a mess, but by God's grace, moving to be more like Jesus. But he sees me and he loves me. That's justification. That's the same thing with you. He doesn't love some future version of you. He's not like, hey, you keep coming to church and then I'll love you. He's not, hey, quit that bad habit, then I'll love you. He says, I love you. He sees all of you, man, and he loves all of you and accepts you. That means this, this that God is not ashamed of you. I mean, someone needs to hear that this morning, that God sees you, he knows your mistakes, your failures and inadequacies, he loves you as you are, and he stands by you, he, he accepts you. It's a powerful truth. I think a lot of times I'm ashamed of myself. I don't know how God could be standing by my side and saying, man, I, I'm for you, no matter what. That's the gospel of justification, the gospel of Jesus Christ, what he's done for us by his, by his life, death, burial, resurrection. Now, that's an amazing truth, and it's a surprising truth that I just said that God sees all of you, he loves you, and accepts you. That's, that's surprising to me. Know why? Because I know me, right? <laughs> that should be surprising what I just said to you. You should be asking, well, how can that be? Does God lower his standard? No. How does he love you and accept you and see all of you? And, and, and it, it's because of Jesus. That's the gospel of grace. He looks at his son and says, he lived where you failed. He died where you deserve death and condemnation. I give you acceptance. I've risen for you so you can be eternally accepted. 
This is the gospel as it comes into you. It's surprising, right? Because it's about Jesus and you're being found in Christ. Have you been surprised by grace? That's justification. And like I said in Romans 8, 1, it talks about, man, when you experience justification, there's therefore no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Why is there no more judgment for those in Jesus Christ? It's not that God is not a righteous judge anymore. Instead, he judged his son on your behalf. So you have no what? No more guilt, no more condemnation before God. That's justification. It's the gospel's coming to you. And it talked about to the Thessalonican church. It came with power. They started to experience it. They surrendered to it. They, they yielded to it. Have you experienced the love of Christ? Have you experienced the salvation, the acceptance of Christ that comes only in him? In Luke 24, verse 32, it talks about what kind of happens as you're coming to Christ. The disciples are on the road, or some disciples are on the road to Emmaus. Jesus comes and said, they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while, we talk, while he talked to us on the road, while he opened uh, uh, to us the scriptures. What's happening here is Jesus talking to these disciples and he's taking the word of God and he's telling them about the purpose of Jesus, why he came, why he died, why he rose again, all the Bible's about that. And it says their hearts burned. Man, has your heart burned by the gospel of Jesus Christ? Like overwhelmed by, man, the truth and the experience of God loves you, accepts you, has forgiven you is proud of you? Have you come under this truth? Has it, I think a better question, have you been moved by the gospel? Has, has it moved you to tears and worship and adoration for Jesus? That's part of coming to justification. See, justification is really about all the atonement. There's no more condemnation for those in Jesus Christ. Why? Jesus Christ atoned for your sins. He paid in full with his life for your sin. By his precious blood, you are healed. Atonement is done by Jesus, and it happens really at one moment. I mean, if you break down that word, atonement, it's at one moment, then you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And as you put your faith in Jesus Christ, as you profess Jesus Christ, your position changes from a sinner to a child of God. In one moment, as you believe on the name and person and work of Jesus Christ, that you be forgiven and accepted and loved. At one moment, the presence of God floods your heart and you start to experience of God as you believe in Christ. That's justification. Has your position been moved from a sinner to son by belief in Jesus Christ? That's how you're justified. And what does that? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you wanna be loved and accepted and forgiven? That comes through what? Jesus it's for anyone to believe in. Now, the other part of this, not only does the gospel justify someone, the gospel of Jesus Christ, grace sanctifies. That means it grows you. The way that you become a Christian is by Christ alone and faith alone. The way that you grow as a Christian is not different. It's by understanding and believing, beholding, man, the gospel of grace See, as you believe in Jesus, your position has changed. But when you continually believe in Jesus, surrender to Jesus, your conditions start to change. Like your behavior starts to change. When you believe in Jesus, you continue to believe, your behavior is transformed by what the power of the Holy Spirit, right? The presence of God comes into you when you believe for the first time, but you're changed and transformed by the power by believing more and more of the gospel. Your profession of faith is how you become a Christian, but how you're transformed is that possession. You actually start to be possessed by Christ. He moves more and more into you. This is not a new idea, and it's actually a biblical idea. It's all over Scripture, one that 1 Thessalonians affirms. But I'll show you another text that's really easy to understand. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it talks about this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That's justification. How did you become a Christian? By grace, by what Jesus Christ has done for you, by faith. And this is not your own doing, it is a gift from God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now that's justification in Christ alone, by faith alone. Now sanctification, listen to this part, verse 10. This is the next verse. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. He created Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're in Christ, now what? For good works, that's sanctification. In Christ, we are created 
to do good works. How does that happen? In Jesus Christ, you're recreated. That's the sanctifying grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'll give you some more verses here in a little bit. But the gospel, man, justifies and the gospel sanctifies. We'll pick up in verse two. And we're gonna look at what Paul talks about, sanctifying grace. It's a labor of love. Verse two, we will give thanks to God always for you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. So Paul's writing the Thessal- uh, Thessalonican church, saying we're remembering you, we're praying for you. Verse three, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfast of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. It says a labor of love, sanctifying grace. That's how you grow as a Christian. Where does that come from? It says in the Lord Jesus Christ, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we have a labor of love? Or how does that come out of us? Is it by simply trying harder? No, it comes out of understanding what? Our position and work of Jesus Christ, in our Lord Jesus Christ. What it didn't just say, if you have a labor of love, then God will accept you and love you. Is that what it said? No, it says because you have a labor of love, it's because you've been found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Another way to look at it is when you understand how Christ has served you, you will serve other people with that same service. As you understand the generosity of Jesus Christ towards you, you will start to be generous to other people that the same, with the same generosity that Christ has given to you. When you understand how much Christ has sacrificed for you, what will happen? you'll start to sacrifice and labor and love as you've experienced that love uh, in the person of Jesus Christ. That's sanctifying grace. It's birthed out of actually understanding more and more of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Sanctifying grace, it's found in Jesus Christ. So he, he says, an implication of growing in Christ is a labor of love. Now, I think we have to do some work here is what does labor mean? It means work, right? We should be working in love. Why? Because of Jesus. We should be working in love because of Jesus. I think we need to get this straight. God is not opposed to your good works. He expects them. He expects good works because it's part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What he's opposed to is earning. You cannot earn your salvation. That's in Jesus Christ. He expects you to work. Know why? Because you're in Jesus Christ. He is opposed to you earning your salvation because it can never be. He expects, as you experience the sanctifying grace of God, you will work and have great effort. You will sacrifice and you'll be long-suffering just as Christ has done for you. It's a sanctifying truth. Now, we should labor in love. We should, that means the sacrifice, our time, talents, and tre- treasures should be given for the good of other people to the glory of God. Now, some people are still like, I don't know, Scott, work, you know, it seems it's a, little, you know, a little sketchy. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, I like this verse because it's Paul. Paul's right on. He says, but by the grace of God, I am who I am. Who does he attribute who he is to? God, it's grace that's done it. And his grace toward me was not in vain. That means it's, it's not purposeless. It says, on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. So what is enabling Paul to work harder than anyone else? What does it say? It says grace. This grace sanctifies and it produces work in you. Another way, a labor of love, is when you experience the love of Christ, you know what you start doing? You start getting busy for Christ. See, until then, you live for yourself. Everyone else is their king until you meet King Jesus. And when you meet King Jesus and understand his loving tenderness to you, 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 what do you do? You start living for Christ as your king. That's working under the Lord. Are you working that way? That's a labor of love. And this, this should transcend Every aspect of the Christian life, and you know, by God's grace, more and more and more will come under the, the rule of Christ, this labor of love, but it's a progression. In Colossians 3.23, it talks about every area this labor of love should transcend. It says, whatever you do. So like you can fill in the blank, anything that you do as a Christian, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Who are you working for? King Jesus. Our life should be marked 
for getting busy for Christ, working under the Lord, like I said, in every avenue. So most people work. Like why, why should you work? See, a lot of people are like, why go to work to get money? Well, that's, that's not a bad reason. Who do you work for? It's not your boss. Who do you work for? Under the Lord. Why do you go to work is to glorify God with your talents for his glory and other people's good. That's why you work. I hear all the time about bosses and complaints and all this stuff. You know what? You may have a bad boss, but you don't work for him. Who do you work for? You work for God. He says, working for the Lord. You know how much joy and purpose is there? You're not trying to please men. You're working really out of the pleasure of God. I mean, you could be like, why do you live in the neighborhood you live in? A lot of people, well, you know, I live there because he has this size house and we're looking for a pool and all this. Listen, if you're working under the Lord, why do you live in the city and community that you live in? Under the Lord. God has put you in the neighborhood he wants you in. Why? To serve those people, to love on those people, to know those people. See, most of us look at our, our lives and it's like we're trying to serve ourselves. When you come to know Jesus Christ and how he served you, who do you serve? The people that he's put you around. Is that how you view your neighbors? Is that how you view your community? This is working under the Lord, not unto self. You know, why do you have the friends that you have? Most people view friendship as how they make them feel. Maybe it's, you know, interests, shared interests or likes, or, you know, they think they're cool and that, you know, their reputation can grow from knowing that when you understand what it means to be a Christian, you are bound together in Christ. You serve not to get something from them. You serve just to bless them, to, to, to help them to become more like Jesus. Like parenting. I mean, anything that you do is under the Lord. Most parents, really, their parenting's terrible. And, and, and I, I say that because it's not under the Lord. They want little kids that make them look awesome. That's really what they want. They want them to be quiet. When they say be quiet, be why? Not because they actually care about their character. They don't want to be embarrassed in front of other people. That's not working under the Lord, right? You want your kid to be the best athlete or the star student or, you know, the best in their preschool. Why? Why does it matter? Right? Because he thinks it makes you feel good. Really, the primary goal of a parent is to shepherd their little hearts unto the Lord. They need Jesus. And we want to see the character of Christ formed in them. That's good parenting. All these other things don't matter. They will pass away. What, what, why do you do anything you do? It's under the Lord. You know how much purpose and joy and clarity. Why are you doing anything for the glory of God and the good of other people? You can put anything in there. You know, another normal activity, we give. We have a joy box, and everyone doesn't want to talk about giving. But we give. Not so you, you can just make, you know, make yourself feel good. You don't give just because I'm talking about it. Why do you give? You give under the Lord. Who are you giving to? God doesn't need your money. He, he owns everything. So why do you give under the Lord saying, this is yours. I believe in the mission of the church to see restore the lives for the gospel with God's glory. This matters. Man, if you're not giving for right reasons, I would, you need to check your heart. We give unto the Lord. This is a sacrifice, a labor of love that comes understanding the generosity of Christ. These are normal activities. There's some supernatural activities that God may bring into your life. Maybe that's particularly investing in kids. That's awesome. Maybe that you're a teacher or mentoring kids that are in need. Man, pay attention to that. We work unto the Lord. Maybe that's fostering kids. That's maybe being hospitality, inviting the least of these into your home and helping them. Maybe that's going to visit Man, seniors that have no family that love on them to say they're known and loved and pray for them. Maybe that's serving in the little door to teach these little kids about Jesus. I don't know. But we work. Why do you live? It's under the Lord. Everything is his. See, Romans 15, 26 talks about this labor of love that's sounding forth from the Thessalonican church that Paul's applauding. Hey, I see your labor and love in Christ. It says this, for Macedonia, which is the region where Thessalonica is at, and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. What's going on? The Thessalonican church sees the poor saints, church in Jerusalem, say, we're gonna do something about that. That's a labor of love. That's using their money for the glory of God and other people. We should be known by the labor of love as God is working in us, as we're going into maturity in Jesus Christ. 
The, the second part that he mentions here is there's a labor of love and a steadfast hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Where does steadfast hope in our Lord Jesus Christ? It doesn't come from e- being, you know, life being easy. See, a sanctifying grace, a steadfast hope, is this not wishful thinking? I mean, that sanctifying grace comes from what? Knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we have a steadfast hope? By the gospel of grace, that's how we have a steadfast hope. So what does it mean to have a steadfast hope? A steadfast hope means you have a unmovable hope that's found in Jesus Christ, the gospel. That means you have an unswerving hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have an unflappable hope, a singular, one-minded, single-minded type hope that only comes in Jesus. That's sanctifying grace. And hope is simply, we have a confidence of the outcome. We know how this ends. So hope allows us to walk through anything because we have an expectation and assurance of Christ's return. See, what it, what it doesn't say is you can have a steadfast hope when everything's going easy in your life. You can have a steadfast hope when, you know, clear, clear skies and, and smooth sailing. When do you have steadfast hope? It says in verse six for the Thessalonican church, it says, and you became imitators of us and for the Lord, for you received the word, what? In much affliction. There's, there's steadfast hope when there's much affliction. And I'm gonna tell you something. I was gonna have everyone raise their hands when I first read the sermon. I'm not gonna do it. I want you to ask yourself a question. Are you under affliction And I bet if I asked that question, 99% of people would raise their hand that they feel affliction in their life. You know why? Because you're human. There is pain. This this life, or you're young, you don't know anything yet. This life is hard. People are gonna betray you. They're gonna hurt you, right? You're gonna have pain in your health, in your relationships, It's hard, affliction. And it says that you can have steadfast hope despite your circumstance. Why? Because it's found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's outside of you. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ and steadfast hope says, I want you to get comfortable in being uncomfortable. See, everyone tries to work for their comfort and says, really, that's not gonna be very long seasons. He goes, I want you to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. How do you do that? The steadfast hope that comes from sanctifying grace in Jesus Christ, the way that that works. One Christian commentator, he quoted this on this text, and it's good. It says, a man can endure anything. Think about that. You can endure anything that the world comes at you or anything that you're going through as long as he has hope. See, hope is the key for endurance, So what are we hoping? For then he is willing to walk, not into the night, but into the dawn. The reason why we can endure is we have eternal hope of we know how this thing's in in Jesus Christ. We know that everything at the end is going to be all right. That's how we walk. We're not walking into darkness. We walk into the dawn. Why? Because Christ will return. Verse 10 says it this way. It says in verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven. See, the part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, he lived, he died, he rose again, he's now at the right hand of the Father, which says he will return. We're waiting from the son or for the son to return from heaven. What is he gonna do when he returns? He's gonna make all things new. There'll be resurrection, there'll be bodily resurrection. We'll receive glorified bodies if you're in Christ. You will live forever where there's no more pain, no more tears, no more hurt. All sad things will come untrue. This is our eternal hope in Jesus Christ. That's our singular hope. See, what happens is when your world starts falling apart, it exposes where your hope is because all you have is really Jesus. You think you have other things. Your world's gonna betray you. Christ will never betray you. He's going to return. We get busy for, the, for Christ as long as God gives us the days on this earth and we wait for his return because there will be resurrection and renewal of all things. See, I picked, I mean, really, this is the hope of all Christianity. It's, been, it's everywhere in scripture. So we were in a Bible study on Thursday morning at 6 a.m. for our men's Bible study. That's a plug. You should come if you're a man. But we're in Daniel 2, and it talks about what? The eternal hope of Jesus Christ coming again. Daniel 2, it's not just at Revelation, it's everywhere. 
What's our hope? Daniel 2 verse 44 says this. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end and it shall stand forever. What's it talking about? Christ returning his forever kingdom. And then I love what Daniel says in verse 45. He says, this dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. What is he saying? This is gonna happen. Christ is going to return. This is our eternal hope, this steadfast hope. This is sanctifying grace. This is what the gospel brings doesn't just bring you into a right relation with God, praise God, yes and amen, but also matures you to become more like Jesus, that we can love like he's loved us, that we can have a hope beyond hope. Why? Because of the future kingdom that's coming. This is the gospel. Now, what's so amazing is if we cling to this gospel, many more people will come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They'll be justified. As we cling to this gospel, not only will more people come to know Jesus, they will mature, will be more known for Christ's character in us, we'll be known as laborers who love. We'll be people that will have hope beyond this temporal world into eternity. And you know what happens when that happens? Man, the glory of God, God is spread to the city of this area, the cities of this area, but also to the nations. Only part of a movement of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that it says it's possible here. I get often asked a lot, how do you, how do you get... How do you grow a church? And I, I'm not sure what actually when someone asks me what they mean. I think what they mean is how do you get more people here? Well, that's never been our goal, just so you know. We want people to come and know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then we want to mature them. How do we do that? According to this text, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not a different message. The same grace justifies and sanctifies. Now, when that happens... Man, more people that meet Jesus and go, hey, I, you know, I've been forgiven. I am loved. I have a new identity. They're going to go tell their friends. You know what? More people come. As you mature and the labor of love goes out from your life, they're going to, why do you love that way? You know what you can do? You point to Jesus. Now, we'll pick up in verse 6 about the movement of the gospel as you proclaim it and live it out by the grace of God. It says, and you will become, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For receive the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. He's talking about the Roman regions. All of Macedonia were watching their example and taking notice. All the region of Achaia was looking at the Thessalonican church and sitting up and taking notice. Then listen to this. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but listen, your faith in God has gone forth. Where? Everywhere, everywhere. I mean, we can send shockwaves to the nations by what? Exalting Christ. Christ who justifies and sanctifies. That's what happens. That's an incredible truth. Man, will we be a church that clings to Christ and Christ alone? Because as we do, people will be justified and they'll be sanctified for the glory of God. And hear me, the good of the nations not only your neighborhood, the nation's shockwaves will be sound forth that only God could get credit for. Let's pray. God, I pray that you'd help us respond. And the only way that we should is which worshiping King Jesus. We thank you that he lived, he died, and he rose again and will return. And in that we can be justified, forgiven, known, loved, and accepted. And we thank you for that grace that meets us at our lowest point and starts to transform, uh, transform us to be more like you. I pray that the power of your spirit would allow us to experience you, that we'd feel that burning in our heart and we'd be moved from one degree of glory to the next as we see just the beauty and the glories of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that we'd enjoy you, not only in song, but in our lives, and we'd live for you, we'd get busy for you, Lord, and we'd wait on your return. And that we would see a movement of God to the nations that you get credit for. We ask that in Jesus' powerful name, amen.